Hello everyone, I am back with another King of the Hill analysis video. You guys like King of the Hill? I like talking about King of the Hill. So everybody wins. Today we'll be looking at the episode Lost in My Space, Season 13, Episode 4. Alright, let's just dive right in. It's a slow day at Strickland Propane due to the needs of the magic gas being low. Not cold enough for propane? Not hot enough for propane. Goldilocks season, honey. Oh, never mind. I guess Roger does come back for more than one episode. So some employees, mainly Donna, are keeping themselves entertained by watching funny internet videos. Hank is not amused and tells Donna she's at work and to turn it off. She says there's nothing to do, and Hank suggests... Have you done your expense reports? Ugh, fine, I'll do the expense reports. Hank, a response like that warrants a lot more than just shaking your head. Then Joe Jack sees a regular customer of Strickland buying propane across the street from a competitor. When Hank confronts him, the man claims that he became friends with Thatterton on MySpace. What are you talking about, your house? Hank presses that they've always been friends, to which the man replies... Yeah, but on MySpace you get to know someone real fast. There is a lot of truth in this. Quite relevant. What's Weezer? Exactly. And that too. Hank goes back to the store and tells everyone that their customer was usurped from them due to MySpace. Buck is as clueless as Hank is, until Donna enlightens them all that it's a social network that allows you to, well, socialize. And Buck is determined to get a piece of the action. Also, quick aside, the letters to the right of Buck's head are on top of the glass. Hank pushes back, saying they already have a tried and true method of informing customers about propane via a cell sheet. But Buck is determined to... Gotta keep up with the times, old time! <sighs> So Hank puts Donna in charge of putting Strickland propane on MySpace. It sure beats the rest of the crap I normally have to do around here. Donna. Uh, why does this woman still have a job there? Now let's quickly gloss over this episode's side plot. Dale believes truffles are overpriced. Nancy got some truffle, shaved on her pasta, and it cost $30. It was a good thing we got separate checks. So he rented a pig that he can use to sniff out his own truffles, which in itself isn't as silly as you think, as Texas does indeed have pecan truffles, albeit less valuable than black truffles. The episode doesn't make it clear what kind they serve at that's amore, but I digress. The only time these two plots interact is here, where Bill wants to come truffle hunting with Dale. You do know these aren't chocolate truffles, right? Of course I know that. And Hank comes up asking if the guys have ever heard about MySpace. Bill says it's his new favorite thing now, while Hank shows concern about people wanting to converse with so many strangers. Bill counters that they only start out as strangers, but also... Then they become your friends. <laughs> Not the kind of friends that you hang out with, but the kind that you type to when you're drunk. There's a lot of truth in that statement, too. Boomhauer also speaks of it, saying that he put his couch photo on his profile. I don't think I want to know what the couch photo is. Hank explains that it's more effective to speak to people face-to-face. Face-to-face interfacing is obsolete. There's over 400 expressions that you can make with symbols online. You can only make two expressions with your face, Hank. Dale has some pretty good lines in this episode. Bill also admits that he reveals things on MySpace he can't ever tell to his friends in person. Don't go to MySpace, Hank. Very, very relevant. So after Donna sets up the Strickland MySpace page, the results are almost immediate and new customers start coming in. Enrique! I'm Alan 252 from MySpace. Came to get that grill. Hey! I saw that picture of you in Cancun, man! Do you think I would like scuba diving? Alan 252? Man, get your butt over here! Hank is impressed at first at how effective the new marketing is, but then his attitude quickly turns sour when he sees what else is being allowed on the page. <laughs> Joe Jack, huh? Who knew? Watch this one. Woo! Dance with me! Come on, I'm so drunk! <laughs> I was so drunk. Hank tells Donna that the content is not appropriate in representing the brand and demands that she take it down. However, Buck is having such a great time on MySpace himself and is also so happy with all of the new customers that he puts Donna on MySpace duty full-time, promoting her to assistant manager of new media. Huh, now that I think about it, this is probably one of the first depictions of such a position on television. 
Or maybe it isn't, I don't know. Donna takes to the position immediately and propositions. Now that I'm an assistant manager, we're gonna take this place to a new level. First order of business. We need to add some new video to the site. So, who wants to get kicked in the ding dong? Have to admit, Donna understands what gets fast clicks. The next morning, Hank is venting to his family about MySpace and says, The whole thing is like a contest to see who can make the biggest ass of themselves. The relevancy! The rest of the family then gush about how much they love MySpace. Peggy even admits that she pretends to be a celebrity so she can learn secrets about their friends. Con is manic depressive. That's actually another episode's plot. At work, Buck excitedly announces that they have over 500 friends. Another customer comes in and asks to buy a propane tank from Joe Jack, one that he's freaked. There's a lot of layers of ill in these few lines. Buck is delighted with the new business, but Hank laments, But at what cost? Well, we'll be getting to that very soon. The other employees at the store are looking at each other's profiles and learning a little too much about each other, to which Hank tells them that that's not appropriate. This is a workplace, so get back to work. While Donna takes a picture for Hank's profile. Oh, and back to the side plot. Am I handsome? Do hunters ask each other that question? The rental pig Dale got runs off and they run after it. Okay, back to the main plot. Hank is doing his job and talking to a customer when Donna tells him that he still needs to complete his profile. Hank says he's with a customer to which Donna counters. There's a billion potential customers online. I think you need to deal with them first. Um, there is a potential customer right there though, Donna. But Buck doesn't seem to understand this either and tells him to... Get blogging! The customer asks Donna for help, to which she replies she can go to the MySpace page and post questions there. <sighs> Are we getting some familiarity here? Hank begins blogging, discussing actual propane accessories as his job entails, but Donna says that that's boring. She decides to show Hank her profile page. Good lord, Donna! Good lord indeed, Hank! How is Donna still employed? Maybe I was just too young in my old MySpace days to see it back in 2009. But did adults really go around just posting stuff like that? Ew. Okay, back to the side plot. Dale tries to get Ladybird to pick up the scent of the rental pig and Peggy gives him leave to take Ladybird with him. Okay, so back to the main plot where the consequences of airing your personal lives and thoughts in a public forum are starting to be seen. Oh, please, Roger, you're just mad about those pictures. No, my wife's mad about those pictures. I was 30 days sober! Strickland employees are fighting and taking things very personally, and it starts affecting their work. Hank tells them to stop fighting, and Donna tells them to save it for the blogs. Hank presses that it's important to not let customers know everything about the fighting, because it's not necessary for them to, but Donna says it's exactly what the customers want. Yeah, I totally want to know who hates who at the Whole Foods when I buy my sparkling waters. She also tries to argue that... You don't understand how the world works anymore. You don't get my generation. We're the same age. Oh, that's just sad. Donna starts flexing her assistant managerial powers and tells Hank he needs to blog even though he was already about to about propane accessories. So Hank blogs what he's thinking. Donna is an idiot. Post. Nice, Hank, though I would have just said Donna is fired because, for real, she has been causing nothing but trouble for the business in the name of marketing. But we'll get more into that later. So Donna claps back. I'm sure my 4,000 friends will find that very interesting. Well, that's supposed to scare me, huh? Are your 4,000 friends going to come out of the computer and get me? Hmm. The people are not really in the computer, Hank. That will be like poltergeist. I love you, Danny Trejo. 
And now we're getting to the real meat of this episode's relevance. But first, the guys get the idea of just using Ladybird to find the truffles instead of using the pig, so Dale steals the truffle and uses it to go hunting. Okay, back to Strickland. It's the next day, and Hank wants to discuss with Donna what happened, but she insists that it's a new day and that they should just move on. So Hank begins preparing the store for opening and sees a lot of people outside. Hank wonders what's going on, and Donna says... It's called a flash mob. My 4,000 friends don't think I'm an idiot. Unfortunately, Buck walks in and sees the people and mistake them for customers. And then, well, this happens. That must be Hank! Get him! Good lord! That is beyond horrifying. Props to Joe Jack for keeping them at bay. What a beast. So Buck gets beaten up and Donna asks how this could happen. And finally, we get some justice. Donna, you're fired. What? Donna blames Hank for all of this, saying, I need supervision. It is in all of my reviews. Buck stands by Hank's decision and says she's fired as well, to which Donna storms out. Um, okay, fired? Donna should be looking at some dang criminal charges. My memory is a little bit murky on how the law handled online facilitated assaults and other crimes back then, but I'm pretty sure Donna could have been given some jail time even then. She got off easy. So the Strickland MySpace page is deleted. Now if you want to see Melinda drunk, you gotta go to the chimney sweep after five. And Hank hopes things will go back to normal. But the page resurfaces with this video. Strickland is no good! Do not buy from Strickland! Their propane is bad! Let's just remind ourselves that Donna is Hank's age, meaning she's in her 40s and she's making this video throwing a temper tantrum when, really, she should be sitting in a jail cell. The staff are unable to take the page down, so Hank suggests... We gotta get a hold of Donna and talk some sense into her. Or Hank, you can just call the police and say that one of your former employees got your boss brutally assaulted and get a warrant out for her arrest. Donna has more than enough strikes against her to just simply talk to her. Okay, let's keep going. It becomes evident that no one knows where Donna lives because she's not in the company directory. Donna was supposed to update it, but I don't think she did. What did Donna do around here? Um, why was she employed again? Isn't that something you should know, Hank? You were her superior for the past few, however long she's been there. And since Buck paid her in cash and all of the employees that slept with her were too drunk or stoned to remember when they went to her home, they're effectively left with no leads to find out where she lives. Why they don't think to just call the police and say she's responsible for a violent assault is beyond me, but we'll get to that later. So Peggy tries to impersonate someone else in the hopes that it'll trick Donna into revealing her location. She sees right through it, however. And trying to go through friends just isn't an option for Hank. So the only option they have left is to read through her blogs in hopes they can find her. Dear God, she's written every day for the last four years. No wonder she never got any work done at Strickland. Yeah, Hank, once again, why wasn't her butt canned long before? So Hank has to read through hundreds of blogs written by an immature and seemingly unstable middle-aged woman that spends too much time online. Hank is such a trooper. Oof. So while this is happening, the guys are still on the lookout for truffles. I don't really know what length of time has passed in this plot compared to the A plot, seeing as how days have gone by with Strickland, but they're still out and about like it's the same day. But whatever, they don't intersect at the end, so let's just roll with it. Ladybird sniffs something in the ground, and the guys dig up a magic mushroom. Rental Pig comes along and snatches the mushroom and eats it, and suddenly has the urge to listen to Jefferson Airplane. Back at Strickland, Hank is coming up to the last of the blog entries and finds out that Donna is going on a date to a local restaurant that evening. Wait a minute, Hank, why didn't you just start from the most recent blogs first instead of reading through four years' worth of crap? Okay, whatever. So the team find her and confront her. What the hell? What is this, Hank? Your pathetic flash mob? No, Donna, we're your co-workers and we want to talk to you. So, blog me. No, we're real people and we're here to do this face to face. Oh, well, um, okay. Her genuine bewilderment at the idea of talking to someone in person is hauntingly relatable. 
Hank asks her why she's so upset, and Donna said she wasn't being taken seriously. You had plenty to do, and you never did it. Okay, Hank, so you were aware of it. Then why was she employed? Donna said her job was boring, to which Buck asks what she thought an accountant's job entailed. Donna laments that she wished she could do more creative things at work, if only she was given the chance, and Hank says all she had to do was talk to them about it. Propane is a family, and like a family, we shouldn't know each other's inner thoughts. That's what's so creepy about MySpace. Or any internet platform in general. Buck asks her to come back to work, and she accepts. David, listen, I was only dating you because I thought I needed money, but I just got my job back, so... <laughs> yeah, uh, I wouldn't have asked her to come back at all, considering all I've gathered about her as an employee is that she's lazy, a drunk, insubordinate, immature, doesn't do her job properly, if at all, and willing to sabotage their business when she feels she's been crossed. Yeah, no thanks. But whatever, Donna comes back to work, fixes the Strickland MySpace page to look more professional, and is allowed to implement some of her own creative ideas into the workspace. <sighs> so, whatever happened to the pig? Well, that was an interesting one. Admittedly, this episode was already dated by the time it first aired. At the time that this episode came out in late 2008, like King of the Hill, MySpace was already on its way out. Facebook was already starting to take hold by then. And nowadays, Facebook is on its way out. You feel old yet? But I still feel that this episode's overall message is very relevant, if not even more so today. Objectively speaking, social media has proven to be an effective means in marketing, promotion, socializing, you name it. The idea of using MySpace or social media in general to promote your local business isn't necessarily a bad idea. You can get more direct feedback from customers, announce new products and sales, all without having to go through a lengthy process of buying ad space or other materials. But this episode demonstrates how that can get out of hand very quickly. The days of MySpace, and even earlier, LiveJournal and Zynga, were something of the Wild West in the earlier internet days. There was very little corporate intervention, and I don't think people really understood at the time that what you put on the internet will be there forever, and could potentially come back to bite you when you get older. Couple that with the fact that many MySpace users were very young teenagers now having unfettered access to exhibiting their lives were experiencing quite an alarming spike in anxiety and depression since then. Now, I'm not an analyst by any means, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the prevalence of social media in the world could be a major factor. Think about it. If someone has to deal with bullying or anxiety at school, when they're at home, they can at least be away from it. But with social media, if they choose to go on it, effectively nullifies that. Because now there is a constant presence of victimizers in their own homes because of the time they spend on social media, it's like inviting the drama into your home. And I'm not going to get into the whole you can just block them counter, because while that is an option that I'm sure is used a lot, it doesn't take away from the fact that one's online presence is subject to intense scrutiny that can be confronted out of the confines of the computer as this episode demonstrates, especially when it's being used by an age group that is already rife with insecurities, self-esteem issues, peer pressure, etc. Okay, going on a tangent here, back to the episode. Here, Donna seems to blur the line between a professional work environment and her personal life. Because she has been allowed to indulge in her online persona while at work, she and others have taken it upon themselves to let it affect their work. It's not strange that coworkers hang out when they're not at work, but here she takes it to another level. Which leads me to the next point. Putting too much on the internet. For those of you that were born after 1998, the popular social media and user-driven sites were like the Old West. People really were doing just about anything. Heck, I remember the early days of YouTube when you could watch an entire movie for free in 10-minute intervals in like 13 parts. People really didn't see anything wrong with airing all of their dirty laundry on the internet because they probably assumed that it would just get buried with everybody else's. In fact, in some very messed up instances, people thought it made them quirky instead of a sick perv. But back then, there were not that many instances of it affecting someone's life. Sure, you could have some backlash, but not to the point where it disrupted your livelihood. 
Nowadays, a tweet that you sent out over a decade ago can effectively cost you your job. That seems a bit ridiculous, as I don't know a single person on planet Earth that is the same after a decade. People can change, people can learn, people can grow. Some things could have been more acceptable at the time. But the fact stands, if it's put on the internet, it's there forever. It may be somewhere in the most obscure corners of the web, but it's there. And if someone looks hard enough, they will find it. In the case of this episode here, Donna is straight up implying that she would be willing to stop taking birth control to purposefully get pregnant with someone who is unaware of her plan. She's also openly admitting that she sleeps with her coworkers and her boss. The other coworkers soon begin to let everyone's personal thoughts and posts affect their work. As if posting something online specifically about someone where you know that person will see it won't cause any problems. Back when I had Facebook, I'd see so many friendships and families be torn asunder because of arguments on Facebook. Personal thoughts and opinions are taken so personally by other people. I too have had my fair share of internet debates. That's when I made the decision to get rid of Facebook. Thankfully, nothing I've posted has cost me my job, but be smart, people. Don't go posting where you work. You don't know what a malicious person could do with that information. And if your coworkers are on your social media page, don't share more than what you want them to know. You wouldn't invite them over to your home and just let them watch you. Hank said it best when he said this. And like a family, we shouldn't know each other's inner thoughts. That's what's so creepy about MySpace. Now for a quick personal story about my MySpace experience. I signed up when I was 15 years old at the behest of my friends. I became engrossed in the whole thing and started joining a bunch of clubs like Sailor Moon and The Legend of Zelda. One particular club I joined was called the Triforce Brigade. I think the founder has since migrated over to Facebook, but I'm not affiliated with the new group. Anyway, it was there that I met someone that became one of my best friends. We'd talk on the phone, video chat, share our lives, all that good stuff. We knew full well that since he lived in California and I lived in Texas, no relationship would be possible. Neither of us were interested in having an internet boyfriend-girlfriend, so we remained friends. But after six years or so, long after MySpace was even a thing anymore, I was at a crossroad in my life. We're talking, you need to make a decision to change something or be miserable forever crossroad. I decided that I wanted to give a real relationship with this friend a shot and resolved to meet him in California, which I did. I also come to find that he wanted to give it a shot too. And that experience set a fire underneath me to finish college, leave Texas, get a job and be with this person. We've been married since 2016. Now, why share all of this? Because I love this story, that's why. It was because of my space in a strange roundabout way that I am where I am today. Even in my old high school days with social media, I had to deal with high school drama and when I got older, college and coworker drama. But the one constant I got from social media in general was because of my space. And that's at the heart of why I wanted to analyze this episode. Social media is not inherently evil. I'm not in the camp that believes it was a mistake. I do believe that social media is a tool, a powerful tool, and when used incorrectly can have devastating consequences. It is very fascinating to me that a show that existed before social media was able to correctly predict how its misuse can lead to a bad work environment, loss of job, and even bodily harm. On the other hand, responsible use can open doors for you. You can meet new people, talk to companies directly, market yourself, discuss new ideas, create your own content. There are so many possibilities. Heck, I remember a time when internet celebrities were only known, well, on the internet. Nowadays, it's not surprising at all to see such people as guests on popular late night talk shows, music videos, heck, even cameos in South Park. We've certainly come a long way. This episode explores both possible outcomes and demonstrates the dangers of being terrible behind a computer and giving your company much more exposure. Personally, I've since deleted most of my social media accounts and haven't looked back. And let me tell you, I think I feel a lot better because of it. And that was Lost in MySpace. It's such a trip seeing these depictions of MySpace pages because they really did look like that. The top eight friends, the myriad of pictures, the custom background, and not shown here is the music that automatically played when someone visited your page. MySpace came and went pretty quickly when you compare its longevity to Facebook or Twitter. But for those that are my age, it is an interesting piece of internet culture that has yet to be replicated. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Harvey McLeod and I'm here to make videos for you and I will see y'all next time.